How's it going everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to another Professor Oaks challenge. So today, we're going back to the games that kicked off this channel with a bang. My only video with over a million views, Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. I actually messed up the original Fire Red challenge. I did things slightly out of order since there wasn't a guide for it when I did my video. In my attempts to write a guide, I misinterpreted one of the rules and thought that I had to go in the badge order, like Brock, Misty, Surge, Erica, etc. But we were supposed to go out of order to get the most Pokemon possible. So now that we have the correct route thanks to Mulax's guide, link in the description, I'm going to be taking this game on again, specifically Leaf Green version but this time with a few friends. If you're familiar with the 12-pack, we've done videos over on Zwiggo's channel for both Fire Red version and Heart Gold version, and we decided to do a relay version of this Oak Challenge for Leaf Green, swapping off and seeing just how many suffering attempts, just insanity, everything is gonna go crazy, nobody else has done a Professor Oak's Challenge besides me in the 12-pack, so everybody else gets to suffer while I laugh at them. But before I introduce my guests, for the first time ever, this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Now unless you've been watching YouTube for only about 5 minutes, chances are you've heard of Raid Shadow Legends. In fact, Raid is celebrating their 2 year anniversary since blasting through every other mobile game on the market to become one of the best. And they're doing so with tons of events that they're hosting in game like the champion training event to level up your champions for those really tough battles, as well as the artifact enhancement event to give them the best armor possible. After all, how is an ill-equipped champion going to take on the most massive of enemies? And if you really want a challenge, Raid is also hosting several tournaments for amazing prizes that'll help your band of champions conquer any challenge. But what does this have to do with Pokemon, you may ask? Well, I'm glad you did. Since this game has so many champions to collect, over 500 in fact, so you could do a Professor Oak's challenge in this game if you really wanted to. You can even experience the brand new Clan vs Clan tournament, where you and your friends can battle each other's teams to see who comes out the very best like no one ever was. And if that wasn't enough for you, they're also releasing the first champion in the badass looking Shadowkin faction, which I can't wait to see and I'm definitely going to try to get my hands on them. Raid is already huge, and their whole anniversary event just makes it an awesome time to join the Raid community, so don't wait around. If you want to get a huge head start in your Raid adventure, then go down in the description or scan this handy QR code on your screen to get an amazing bonus. There's the free epic champion Jotun, who I've found to be super useful in the Doom Tower mode, 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and 3 ancient shards so you can summon even more dope champions as soon as you get in game. You'll find your rewards here in your inbox for the next 30 days only, and you can even find me in game under the name Chaotic Meat. And if you're quick enough to hop into the anniversary celebration, you can even join my clan and maybe participate in some of those good old clan versus clan tournaments. We'll pound everybody into the ground, it'll be a great time. It's that easy though, just click the link in the description and I'll see you in game. Again, I want to give a huge thanks to Raid Shadow Legends for the sponsorship. It really makes me feel like I've actually made it as a YouTuber now. Anyway, let me introduce my guests for the Professor Oaks Challenge Relay today. I'll be starting out, but joining me are Christian Pokemon Champion. How's it going guys? This is Christian Pokemon Champion, Chaotic Big Ball. Thanks for having me on board. Our Pokemon TCG Progression Series partner, R9 Beats. I can't read. Coach Max. Hey. That's me, Coach Max. The Honest Pokemon Trainer. Hello, I am the Honest Pokemon Trainer. You can tell by my totally authentic voice and not because I didn't have the chance to send Chaotic an introduction message. Thanks for having me. The Lottie Twin Master herself, Luster Purge Pink. What's up everybody, it's Luster Purge Pink here, back with the 12 pack once again. One of my trusty editors, Arantula. The name's Arantula, the Diet J Rose 11 and Small and by Day, Paper Mario Enthusiast by Night. The true hero of Pokemon, Zwiggo. Well, hello everyone, it's Zwiggo here, and uh, I want to thank PewDiePie so much for letting me on his channel. It really is a huge upper. What? What do you mean this is not PewDiePie's channel? Wait, it's, it's on Chaotic's channel? Okay, well, th this is awkward. And lastly, Britain's fifth favorite challenge runner, Plonkerboy900. Hey guys, Plonkerboy900 here. Big thanks to Chaotic Meatball for having me. There's only 10 of us here today since the other two were busy, but honestly it made me 
have an easier time dividing up the sections. And yeah, I know, I put 12 in the video title, but it's gotta be uniform. Now that the quota has been fulfilled, let's get into my part, shall we? Oh hey, uh, I think, I think, uh, you forgot somebody named Tion. Um, yeah, never mind, it's not important. So, if you're not familiar with the Professor Oaks challenge, since I'm sure a ton of you guys are coming from the other channels, let me describe it to you like this. Rule number one, you must capture and evolve every Pokémon before every gym badge. This means getting Pokémon like Venusaur and Pidgeot before Brock, etc, etc. That's enough to prove the point. This is the basis of the challenge. Rule number two, only one game can be used and no contact with other games. No trading with Fire Red, Ruby Sapphire Emerald, Colosseum XD, even no GBA insertion for the Gen 4 games, not that it matters. And rule three, no glitches. If you've already seen my video of the Fire Red Professor Oaks challenge, then this route will look similar to you, but there will be differences to make up for the mistakes in that one. Starting off, of course, I selected Bulbasaur as my starter over Charmander or Squirtle since it evolves at level 32 rather than 36, which is a significantly large amount of EXP, especially when we're looking at the evolution level between the two, and the highest level of Pokémon we'll be fighting for around 20 hours will be level 6. After getting the Pokédex, I'm able to truly begin the challenge, getting 5 Pokéballs as well. Our first catches are over on Route 1, those being Rattata and Pidgey, and over on Route 22, where I'm able to get Spearow and Mankey. These didn't take more than 10 minutes to grab combined, so all that's left for the section is the Viridian Forest. I've taken it upon myself to capture everything for this section, though Christian Pokemon Champion will be having to evolve several of these Pokemon, though I won't leave him hanging with too many of them. So after grabbing Weedle, Caterpie, and Pikachu, shockingly quickly I might add, no pun intended, it's training time. I've been tasked to evolve Pidgey, Caterpie, Weedle, and Rattata, leaving CPC with Bulbasaur, Spearow, and Mankey, and taking down Brock. So I went to work. The trainers in this area are great for leveling up Pidgey, especially early on around level 9-ish, which is when it learns Gust. Of course, switch training for the bugs is one of the few ways to get them to benefit on these trainer battles, and it wasn't quite enough to evolving anything, getting Caterpie to level 6 before it's time to grind on the wild Pokemon. My main mission here was to evolve Pidgey once, then use the Gym Whiteout strategy to level it as fast as possible, as this worked in my red and blue POC. So after getting Caterpie to evolve into Metapod at level 7, I just focused on Pidgey with one round of power point usage being enough to get it to level 18, evolving into Pidgeotto. I still want to use Switch training here though, so I deposited everything aside from Metapod and went into the gym, taking down the Camper before trying the Gym Whiteout strategy with an additional Pokemon. This does not work at all, it just takes too long. Pidgeotto is still struggling at this level to take out Geodude due to being resistant and only doing 2-3 damage per attack, Therefore, I just decided to forego this. I don't think it'll help in comparison to just using all the power points available to me to train in the Verdian Forest, so I just went back in there. After that though, things started to progress relatively quickly. The bugs evolved first, getting Weedle into Kakuna at level 7, Metapod into Butterfree at level 10, and Kakuna into Beedrill at level 10, leaving just Rattata and Pidgeotto to take a while, but due to their same type attack bonuses and moves, are able to evolve relatively quickly into Raticate at level 20 and Pidgeot at level 36 respectively. I managed to do all of this in less than 10 hours, completing my subsection with a time of 9 hours and 30 minutes. Alright CPC, good luck and have, well, hopefully some semblance of fun. How's it going everybody? My name is Christian Pokemon Champion, and I'll be doing the rest of Pre-Batch 1. My directives, fully evolve Spearow, Bulbasaur, and Mankey as quickly as possible. Merely after Chaotic gave me the file, I did some experimentation. At this point of the game, there's only really three viable training options. One, Viridian Forest, two, Route 2, and three, Brock's Gym. Specifically Brock's Geodude and then losing to Onyx to keep the experience. After practicing in each area, I found that battling Brock's Geodude tended to elicit the best results. 
That is, I was able to obtain a total of 440 experience points within a time span of 4 minutes, while other areas were closer to 200 experience. Now that we have determined this, let's begin! Immediately I decided it was best to switch train. In this case, Menku was too weak to fight at this point, so I switched into Bulbasaur, allowing him to defeat Geodude and lose thereafter to retain the points. This also means that I need to change my battle setting from shift to set, so that the game doesn't waste my time by asking me if I want to switch a Pokemon after defeating Geodude. During this time, I learned to not accidentally use Vine Whip on Onyx, beating Brock, and wasting a bunch of my time. Well that sucked. I also did my best to take as few steps as possible to save on time. Lastly, I learned that this strat only worked for a time. Here's why. Toward the beginning of switch training at the gym, Onyx was relatively strong and was able to take out Bulbasaur with a good time. However, eventually Onyx would take more time to feint my team since my team eventually got bulkier and bulkier. In this case, by the time Bulbasaur reached level 17, it was better to change things. But I'm not done with Brock yet. It would appear that he is still useful if I switch out Bulbasaur to Spiro. This will allow time for Minky to switch train Spiro instead. Sorry you had to faint so many times, guys. Though I just love that it says that the 12-pack scurried after Brock fainted all my Pokemon. I'm just imagining Zuigo and Chaotic scurrying. Inevitably, it was time for Spiro to evolve. Although I would actually have to go back to Route 2 to level them up. Otherwise, if Brock went to my team, the game wouldn't give me a chance to evolve Spiro. Now that that's over, is it better to keep on training with Brock or to train in the wild? Upon further research, it would appear that it is now a smarter idea just to train in the wild. This is because the Brock technique and Route 2 seem to take about the same amount of time. But Route 2, in the long term, is better because Bulbasaur will eventually have to be level 32 to fully evolve. And I don't think Brock would like to fight a swole Bulbasaur. Now that it's just Mankey and Bulbasaur leveling up to level 28 and 32 respectively, it's just pressing buttons and trying to retain my sanity. Ow, my hand. How about... A singing montage? Finally, I got Mankey to level 28 for them to evolve into Primeape. And I allowed Bulbasaur to evolve into Ivysaur at level 31 and Venusaur at level 32 thereafter. Ultimately, my end time was 21 hours and 24 minutes. Now that I have officially participated in the POC challenge, I am determined to never do it again. This was legitimately tough. So major props to you, Chaotic. Albeit, this was still an enjoyable experience because it felt like a speedrun. And I have recently learned that speedruns are actually pretty fun. Now on to you, R9Beats. So how exactly are things going, guys? You liking the video so far? What's that? Yup. Well, it's my turn, and I hope you guys are ready. Because if you guys didn't know, I'm R9Beats, just that guy that you may have seen playing children's card games with Chaotic here a few times. <laughs> Good old times, wonder why we stopped making so. This is my first attempt at a POC, and don't get me wrong, I've caught them all before in many generations and even have physical proof from printing out the certificates, but this is nothing like that. At least I'm only a small percentage of the completion of this run, so how bad can things really be? First, we gotta take a look at the document that Meatball of Chaotic sent us, and, well, that's a lot of words, and I can't read. But he didn't notice a few of those Pokemon's names, so we should be alright. And <laughs> not gonna lie, this makes very little sense to me, so I may have done a few things that upset the, the Meatball Man. First things first, looking at our party, it's pretty funny considering what I'm used to from the other 12-pack challenges. Just dreading the moment looking at exactly what the last person left. This is the exact opposite, because I can't say I've ever attempted Badge 2 with a fully stacked team. And I mean, Venusaur alone is like, god damn! I'm not sure what's going on with the whole naming thing here, naming them one letter after their name, but... I'm assuming it's the save time and text and uh, I, I guess it, it can't really be that big of a deal, but uh, I'll entertain the idea. Well, maybe it is kind of sus. Well, we easily plow through all the trainers and encounter our first checklist to requirement a Spiro for a trade later on. And well, that was easy, but next up is to catch a Nidoran, and well, we just took a long time to encounter one of these things. But when I finally did catch one, and yes, I nicknamed it N for some reason, directly after the encounter, I ran into a Jigglypuff and easily caught it. Thankfully, we didn't get rested, so in the Nether one off the list, I really thought Nidoran Female would be one of the worst Pokemon to encounter. But no, he literally times that by six, and that's how long it took me to find a Nidoran male. And, uh... It took so long, I did one of those, oh no, I shouldn't have, by using speed up, but shh, it's okay. I did it on my Pokemon Snap Station using Pokemon Stadium. <laughs> Don't tell Nintendo. That's right, I'm a full grown man with a child's video game kiosk. <laughs> Life goals right there, baby. But with all that out of the way, we're in the clear to buy our way through the next objective. <laughs> well, if, if our objective was to buy a useless carp of some sort. And we're off to Mount Moon. Mount Moon is jumping with new Pokemon as we catch Zubat, Geodude, Paris, Clefairy, and thanks to the abundance of Geodudes and having Double Kick, we easily evolve our Nidoran into a Nidorino and a Nidorina, and we evolve Geodude into Graveler. And I, I can't believe how we're really blowing through this. Like this is this is actually like surprisingly easy. Zubat, on the other hand, 
Yeah, he was absolutely terrible to train. He has a terrible time against anything at Mount Moon, and all of his attacking moves just ain't it, champ. At least we only had to get to level 22 while we were evolving into a Colbat. I mean, we should have only had to get to level 22, but Chaotic told me that this thing learns Thief and not to use the TM on it and to save it for another Pokemon. Oh, um, actually it doesn't, buddy, and uh, I wasted more time trying to get this Thief that doesn't exist. <laughs> but it's fine, we'll just call it even because I, I made a mistake and used the speed up because I can't read. But why was Thief so important? Because in Mount Moon here, they only give you two Moonstones, but only four. So we'll have to steal our way to four after encountering Clefairy, and that is an extremely low encounter, may I add, that also have a chance of holding a Moonstone, which is an extremely even lower a chance. And well, this part of the challenge alone took longer than the entirety of the section 10 times over. I'm not even exaggerating this, this took forever. And I haven't played Pokemon since. It's been a rough few days. With that out of the way, we beat this guy and take one of his fossils. Maybe, maybe you guys can take a guess at which one I, I took the dome fossil. I then defeated our rival and many more trainers before finally catching a new Pokemon, Abra, and obviously naming it a speed efficient name of subscribe. You know, for the speed and whatnot. And another one for trade. Speaking of trades, we then trade away our Spearow for a Farfetch'd. And jeez, guy, no speed efficient name? <laughs> How inconsiderate. Next, we catch a Diglett and trade our Abra without a nickname for this creepy clown. And then catch three Diglets at once. Gotta make sure I name that correctly. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Well, <laughs> now it's Moonstone time, so we evolve Jigglypuff into Wigglytuff, Clefairy into Clefable, Nidorina into Nidoqueen, and obviously we gotta get our king. You know, what is a queen without a king? And, uh, I mean, what is a king without a queen? Uh, anyways, we get the Nidoqueen. Arena. <laughs> we get the Nidoqueen. King. We evolved the Nidoqueen. King. No, but the real fun was evolving the Pokemon that didn't require stones to evolve. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. The boring and time consuming swap trading method. Evolving subscribe into subscribe with a spoon. And finally, evolving Magikarp into Gyarados. Taking our Pokedex total to 42. And the time of 34 42. Not bad, all things considering. Wait, one badge? I may have forgot something. Thank you, R&I, my partner in crime. Hello, members of the Meatball Luncheon. I am Arancho, and I'll be your guide today. For my section, we merely will just be handling the rest of the encounter so R&I cannot take home before Misty's gym badge. Get hyped, because it's showtime! To begin, we are in Vermilion City right now, so I think it makes perfect sense to get the bike voucher and get the bike afterwards. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what I do after I get the bike voucher. I snipe myself a bell sprout, which I nicknamed Bard Break after Bard Breaker. As well as a Sanshu, but then I realized you can get Sanshu at a much lower level here and at a much higher level in the future, so I decided to just box it instead of get another one. Oh well, living decks, I guess, can be really useful too. Heading southward to daycare, as I also cast myself a Meowth I named Idota L after I know that laugh. And east of Vermilion City, I cast myself a Drowsy, which I nicknamed Yugen Fan, as well as another Sanshu, which I named Kaijenix. Consider checking all these YouTubers out. I think they're really underrated and can really use some love from you. Now then, the grind. So I have to withdraw the Paris as well, which R9 had caught earlier, and I have to grind all these babies up until they evolve on their respective levels. And we'll go over those in a little bit, but for now, let's just talk about the process of doing this. This took me roughly around four hours to do after catching everything. And it was a really long time, even with the Versus Seeker rematching trainers over and over again. And you know something? I never did really see much value in challenges like this, but if it's for the sake of a race or like this competition, then, you know something? I'm okay with that. Normally I'm a fan of those challenges where the real question is just, is it even possible? And all my solo runs are like that. I like doing runs like, say, Magic Arp only, Papini only, Shedinja only. Like, those are the runs that really, really drive me. But something about runs like this just, man, it makes me wonder how Chaotic Meepo can do this for so many freaking games. Like, that HGSS one that he did for Hard Gold and Soul Silver, like, holy cow. That must have been incredible. Man, of respect to this guy. If you haven't subscribed to him already, please do. I think he really could use the support. Like me, I'm super driven by this community to just get this stuff done and to try and not hold anyone up. In fact, I actually did my section in a single sitting because, well, I really wanted to get it done. And my mom ended up getting kind of worried about me because I just did not want to take a break for at all. And she thought I was just something wrong with me. So, um, yeah. Please make sure that this project is worth it by making sure you watch the whole video to the very end. Because I was trying to find ways to make this go faster too. Like I was battling my rival multiple times in order to make like experience just go faster since he has stronger Pokemon than normal. 
And it was something I also was using up until I got some evolutions to happen while I was doing the battle and didn't want to have to do more levels just than necessary. And while on the SS Sand, I found a TM for Break Break, which I had no problem using on my Sand Shrew because you can get more TMs for this move in Celadon City anyway. So, you know, if it just makes it easier for me, then awesome. And if I can do it without like, hindering anyone else, that's even better. Now gets Payday, so that gets us even more money too. And after a while, we finally got some evolutions happening. First up is Weepin' Bell, who evolves from Bell at level 21. Second is Sand Slash evolving from Sand Shrew level 22. Third is Parasect evolving from Paris level 24. Second to last is Hypno evolving from Jarlazy at level 26. And finally, Persian evolving from Meowth at level 28. And since that's literally every encounter up to when we battle Misty, let's go ahead and take care of her. And after that's Gym Badge, we are finally ready to pass this save file on. Thank you for having me on Chaotic Meatball, but for me, it's time for the curtains to fall. So Coach Max, take it away. Hey y'all, Coach Max time. Super shout out to Chaotic Meatball for getting this together and getting us all involved in it. I've never done a Professor Oak challenge before and this has made me never want to do one. Prepare to not just be disappointed, but like, come on man, that kind of disappointed. I decided to do something different with my part by having an on-screen timer going so you could see exactly how long it took me to do each part of the section. I used a guide online made for the POC to section out my run, but it didn't match everything exactly, so nothing is going to be perfect. Also, here's something I don't even remember doing until I was watching the footage back. I did this whole run while watching college football one Saturday, go Vols, and decided to name every Pokemon after different colleges. It's not worth mentioning all of them, or any of them. Just know that the person after me probably got super confused by seeing every Pokemon have a name that it shares with the college. I was expecting to have to battle Misty, but Misty was already beaten when I loaded up the file. So no big deal, Voltorb was the first Pokemon I needed to get on the route before Rock Tunnel, and I don't have Cut. Who did this before me? Arantula. You're on thin ice. So I backtracked to the SSN to get cut. Not sure why he battled the rival and didn't get cut, but I'll go cry somewhere else. Anyways, after getting cut, taking down all these trainers, and getting Voltorb set us up for Rock Tunnel. The two Pokemon you're gonna catch here are Machop and Onix, and Machop came naturally on my way through the tunnel. But Onix took about five minutes of going back and forth at the exit waiting for the Rock Snake to show up. Route 8 is where you're going to get yourself a Vulpix, and Celadon is where you'll pick up the Easy Eevee at the top of the Celadon Hotel building. Route 16 is the first place you're going to get the opportunity to get Doduo, and then you have to take a pretty big detour. You have to take down Giovanni and the Rocket Hideout so you can get the Sylph Scope to get the next Pokemon that you need. Gastly is an easy addition here, but Cubone and Haunter take a little while longer to show up. I actually knocked out the first Haunter I saw. That was a little annoying. But right after I got Haunter, Cubone decided to pop out, and I didn't have to spend more time than I needed to in this creepy tower. Snorlax on the route below Lavender Town was the one I decided to go get since I needed the Super Rod in the Fisherman's House, and this Snorlax only took 3 minutes to catch. I've spent way more than 3 minutes trying to catch a Snorlax before, so this was nice. Before moving on to the fish I needed to get, I went through Cycling Road to get the Amulet Coin so I could maximize the money I could earn. I decided to save Porygon till the end of my section because I didn't want to spend a lifetime gambling. And in Fuchsia City, where I was going to fish to get Golding and Sea King, I found a Slowpoke. So I caught Slowpoke here. The guide I was using didn't have it here in this part, but I got it, so that's what matters. Golding and Sea King showed up relatively quickly after this too. Always nice to get some quick encounters. Below Fuchsia is where I was supposed to get Horsey, Krabby, and Kingler. Supposed to. Krabby popped up immediately, but Horsey and Kingler simply don't exist. Not here at least. I went over to Route 13, and that's where Horsey actually lives, and instead of googling and trying to find where Kingler is, I just took Krabby and evolved it while getting money for Porygon. About halfway done with all the Pokemon I need for my section, and it's only taken me about two hours. That's a good sign, right? Venonat was obviously an easy find, but Ditto took about 20 minutes to appear. And Ditto was just the calm before the storm known as the Safari Zone. I decided to go for Jatini first, thinking it would take the longest to catch. I was wrong. Very wrong. Fortunately, I guess. First off, Poliwag showed up. 
The guide didn't even have Poliwag in my section, but I thought why not, and I caught it there. And it only took two Dratini encounters to catch this thing. I was shocked, legitimately. There's times where I've tried to get Dratini and it just wouldn't exist. Only 10 minutes too. This got my hopes up, just to dash them expertly. Rhyhorn was the first grass encounter, and Execute followed shortly afterwards. Then the fun part started. I had to get all of the 4% encounters. Pincer was up. It only took four pincers to catch this one. I never played the rock and bait game with anything. I just threw safari balls over and over and over. After only about 15 minutes, I got pincer. The first Kangaskhan showed up after only 10 minutes. And it took a full 35 minutes to finally catch one of these. Chansey only took three encounters. And only eight minutes, too. I always thought of this one as the rarest of the Safari Zone, but RNG was nice to me. Not so nice in other places. While trying to get Tauros, I found a wild Venomoth. Another Pokemon not in my section, but there we were anyways. Easy catch. But Tauros took 11 encounters to get caught. At this point, I was quickly losing my mind. Almost exactly one hour in my attempts at getting a Tauros. This made me hate Tauros. But nothing will beat Grimer. I hate this Pokemon. I spent an hour and 20 minutes sitting at this stupid water spot in Celadon City trying to fish up this sludge pile. People give Trubbish a hard time, but I hate Grimer more now after this. Staryu was found in Vermilion City along with Horsey, so I don't know why I wasted all that time on Route 13, but after getting Staryu and having caught Slowpoke in Fuchsia City, I didn't have to backtrack to Viridian City, and I had one thing left to do. Spend all of my hard-earned money on the digital demon Porygon. Except I didn't have enough money, so I had to go battle the bikers on Cycling Road a few times to get that last bit of change. And after seven hours, I completed my section. I didn't even have to worry about evolving all these Pokemon. I complained about how I would never do this, but I could actually see myself enjoying this at some point. It really was kind of fun. Meatball, you the man. Y'all have a great day, and enjoy the rest of this video. Hello, it is me, HBT. Now, I've not done a Professor Oak challenge for a long, long time. I think the only time I did it was when I was actually 11. I collected every single Pokemon in red and blue so I could be the cool kid in school who could give everyone a full Pokedex by the first gym. Yeah, I went and got a Dragonite, and a Dragonair, and a Jatini. Imagine how long that bollocks took. Either way, it got me credibility in school. Oh my god, I had a weird life in those days. Now, I have to provide a confession. I actually finished this challenge and was about to send it back when I read no go fast button allowed, which meant I had to restart the whole thing again. Well this is timed and I don't want to be the one who ruins it. My wife was furious because I'd already pumped time into this and now I had to do it all again without the go fast button. So here we go again. Now you all know by now we're given a list of Pokemon we need to obtain and my list didn't really seem that bad. First thing I did was go fishing and I caught myself a Poliwhirl and then for good measure, I catch a second one. Because of that Poliwhirl, I'm able to complete my first trade of the section and obtain a Jinx. I go after the Karate Master in Saffron City, beat his ass, and for my reward, I get a choice between two Pokemon. I go for Hitmonlee. This means I will not be taming Hitmonchan in this run. I next go shopping to get some Evolution Stones to really get the ball rolling by evolving Pikachu into my hero Raichu, Staryu into Starmie, Execute into Executor, Weeping Bell into Victor Bell, Poliwhirl to Poliwrath, and Eevee to Flareon. Now this is the only Eevee in the game, so Jolteon and Vaporeon are not available for this run. With this done, I started doing the most boring bit of the run, grinding. Now this is why I hate these things. I could be spending my time in a pub, but no, I have to go back and forth in a field, beating up the local wildlife, leaving nothing but a huge body count for the local council to sort out. I'm actually surprised the local SJWs have not come after me for cruelty to animals. After a bit of messing around, I get my Grimer to evolve into Muck, and my Slowpoke to evolve into Slowbro. And for my second magic trick, I trade that Slowbro for a Lickitung. I now use my Venusaur to go smash Team Rocket at the Sylph Company, whilst doing so, Doduro evolves into Dordrio, and Machop evolves into Machoke. Machamp is only available for trade, so he is off the table. I always think when I do these sort of stages in Pokemon, is no one else in the building hearing what is going on and coming to investigate? 
Surely if you heard a giant Venusaur going saw, saw, saw everywhere, followed by crashes and bangs, you're not going to radio that in. What about those on the same floor? Hmm, here's something around the corner. Pretty sure it must be nothing. Better not just use a gun to sort out this problem, I don't know. Just hire some competent staff. I battle on and kick YouTube's ass with ease, and I give him a Lapras for being the saviour of men. Finally, I go face Geomate, and yeah, he just falls apart in seconds, and the chairman gives me a Master Ball. I really had to fight the urge to be nice here, as I was going to be a dick and use it on a Pidgey, as that is my thing. But seeing as the guys want to do a race thingy, I have to be good and keep it in the bag. I'm now free to finish the last little bits of my run by grinding and having so many beers. I finally got my Voltorb to Electrode and my Cubone to a Marowak. God, I'm glad that's out the way. Fair play to Chaotic for doing this stuff properly. I would have given up and eaten some donuts by now. I pass on my section to the next victim and until then, I've been HBT. Bye bye. Hey guys, what's going on? Sion here with my part of this Professor Oak challenge video. And I have to tell you guys, this is one of the most tedious and hardest things I've ever done. And I literally did the smallest part known to man. So we are on pre badge 3 part 3. So all I have to do is get right on, Cedra, Porygon, Dragonair, Dragonite, Ninetales, Victory Bell, Slowbro, and Starmie. Well, at least that's what I was supposed to do. I don't know who, but they literally did half my stuff for me. So this honestly shouldn't be too bad. I decided to start off with a Dratini and give it the EXP share and decide to grind with the Versus Seeker on some bikers. It took a while, but eventually Dratini evolved into Dragonair, and with even more time passed, eventually Dragonair evolves into Dragonite. This took a very long time to do because Dragonair evolves into Dragonite at level 55, and we don't really have that many good trainers to grind against, so yeah, this took a while to do. By the way, it looks like somebody was saving up rare candies, but since Dragonite is literally the highest level evolution in this game, I don't know if that's true actually. I used them. He had like three saved up, I use them. I don't care. Sue me. And grinding on the same exact bikers with the Versus Seeker, eventually I get Rhyhorn to level 42 where he evolves into Rhydon. I also pick up a Firestone for Vulpix, that way it evolves into a Ninetales. And then I grind up Horsey and eventually evolves into a Seedra. I probably beat the bikers on Cycling Road literally a thousand times to get all these guys evolved. So because somebody did the rest of the evolutions for me, plus I had a pretty easy part, I'm already done. I don't even have a minute 30 of footage and I grind it up for hours. This doesn't seem fair to me. I don't know how you do it meatball but if you want to see more of these professor oak challenges definitely don't go check me out because uh yeah i could just leave out all the meatball peace out guys what is up everybody it's luster perch pink here and it's my turn to take on the professor oak challenge i've truthfully never done this before and i'm kind of notorious for being trigger happy with the speed up button so this should be a fascinating and frustrating test of my patience Though my part is relatively short compared to the others there's still lots to do so without further ado let's pick up where tion left off Party was a mixed bag, to say the least. Though I pity the poor soul that had to train that Dragonite all the way up mid-game. It would come to be a very valuable asset though, sporting Thunder Wave and Dragon Rage, so thank you to whoever suffered through all that grinding. It makes my job a lot easier. I'll pass that Christmas kindness on in any way I can, but I doubt I can match it. Anyway, the first step was defeating Koga. It was simple, of course, considering the pseudo-legend just chilling in my party. I realized though that I wouldn't be able to fly around because I had to put off beating Surge until the latter section of my part, which was sort of a hindrance, but with as many times as Game Freak has sent us back to Kanto, it's fair to say most of us have a decent lay of the land at this point, and getting around in an optimal route shouldn't be too difficult. With the Soul Badge acquired, we can finally take on my section of the challenge. Originally, I was going to surf south of Fuchsia to get to Cinnabar, and I even caught a tentacle on my way, but paused when I realized that I was going to have to do a lot of backtracking if I didn't get my bearings before heading that direction. I know I just said that we should know Kanto like the back of our hands, but I have the same ability as Reggie Gigas when it comes to doing challenges. What little common sense I have was starting to kick in at this point, and I turned around to do things in a better order. The power plant is my first stop, and it is home to three Pokemon in this section. Magnemite, Magneton, and Zapdos. Yes, you heard me correctly. Zapdos. This game is programmed to where if you play your cards right, you can have a legendary Pokemon before you even have four badges. I mean, technically, if you play the game in intended order, you still get a legend relatively early on. I think I'd call this broken, but it's more amusing than anything, and an excellent testament to how Kanto rewards its more meticulous players. Once that place was finished, I headed back to Cerulean and then south to Vermilion. The quickest way back to the earlier towns was through Diglett's Cave, so I happily took it. With our Venusaur as the cut slave, dang, they really slided you, didn't they, bud? I scooped up the old Amber before heading towards Pallet Town. South of Pallet, is where we catch Tangela, which I always thought was an odd place for this little guy, but whatever. That's another Pokemon added to the total. Ah, finally, Cinnabar Island! 
The majority of my section is spent here because of the amount of things we have to do before moving on. First, reviving the dome fossil is a must. Whoever picked this fossil, thank you. Hail the Dark Lord. And then on to the Old Amber, adding Kabuto and Aerodactyl to our decks. Next is the Pokemon Mansion. Coughing can be caught here, but unfortunately Weezing's catchability here is limited to Fire Red, so we've got to manually level this Pokemon up. I slapped the experience share on Kabuto knowing it would be the most annoying to level and I cleaned out the trainers while heading to get the gym key. It gained quite a few levels, though it was nothing compared to the grind ahead. It was time to suck it up and get to it. Kabuto, though being a decently quick Pokemon to level, is certainly agitating to deal with. It's a pitiful Pokemon and it could barely take out a lot of Pokemon in the Mansion or Seafoam Islands without sustaining massive damage to itself. The optimal option was just to send it out first with the experience share and then switch to the Dragonite to have it finish the opponent. Speaking of Seafoam, I got bored of the monotony of grinding at one point and decided to head there to catch the next two Pokemon on our list, Seal and Dugong. That's another evolutionary line down, and the Pokemon around the place gave decent experience, so I made it my grinding spot for a while, but ultimately returned to the mansion for easier healing. Eventually, I got Kabuto up to level 40, and it evolved into Kabutops. I was hoping the next Pokemon on my list, Tentacruel, would be a simple catch in the wild, but unfortunately, the earliest you can catch it is in the Sevi Islands, which don't open up until after Blaine. Lucky for me though, I just so happened to catch a tentacle that was level 35, and I grabbed up the mansion rare candy to push it over the edge. The stars had aligned and I had shaved about 10 minutes of grinding off, netting myself an instant tentacle and a breath of fresh air. Coughing was up next for the evolution, and it was a similar situation to Kabuto. Though Coughing is a better Pokemon in comparison, it struggled against the Pokemon in the mansion. Sure, some of them I could take out, but many are resistant to the poison attacks that Coughing specializes in, so switch training with the experience share was simpler. Though I will say, Raticates are the absolute bane of my existence because of the fact that all of them have Pursuit. A mini a trip had to be taken to the center because the thing killed my Pokemon upon switch out. And the worst part was I had to rely on the thing for the most experience using the Repel trick. It was a mess. <laughs> but Coughing eventually reached level 35 and evolved into Weezing, completing the pre-Blaine section. It was then time to take the man himself on. The Master of Fire, the King of Cinnabar, the... He was easy. Just had to switch out to get rid of the confusion it caused by Outrage, which Dragonite had acquired during the training. Smooth sailing, bud. Smooth sailing. Speaking of sailing, Bill stops us after our victory and asks if we'd like to go to Sevi. I would say no, but the only evolutionary line we need before the final section is only found there, so I oblige. The side quest goes smoothly thanks to Dragonite absolutely wrecking everything in our path. I took some time to stop and smell the flowers on Kendall Road, catching Ponita and its evolution Rapidash in the process. With that, we can move on from Sevi and tackle the rest of the game, but we'll be back shortly to clean up the last few catches of my section. Erica was the next gym leader to take on, as we needed her to grant us the ability to use strength. Now we can head to Seafoam Islands and acquire Articuno. This thing was a bit of an annoying catch with Dragonite and Venusaur being our strongest mons, but ultimately nothing too difficult. Then it's back to Sevi. Didn't I say we'd be back shortly? With strength, we can finally enter the grass on Mount Ember, home to my final catches. I didn't buy balls before heading there, though. But I was too lazy to go back, so we'd have to deal with these last two mons with only one Ultra Ball and a few Great Balls. Magmar was an easy catch, but Moltres was just rude. Come on, dude, you're my last catch. Don't make this harder than it needs to be. Eventually, I got it to stay in a Great Ball, and with that, all the Pokemon before post-game have been captured. But Pink, why didn't you use the Master Ball in any of the three birds? Because, my friend, this is my Christmas gift to the poor soul that's going to have to catch Entei. Considering the thing is a roaming Pokemon and it's annoying to chase, I decided I wouldn't make Plonk's life a living hell. Merry Christmas, from me to you, Plonk. Sentiments aside, the rest of the game is a quick sweep. Arriving back in Vermilion from Sevi, we take on Surge, then head to Saffron to beat down Sabrina. And finally to Viridian to take down Giovanni, my personal favorite gym leader. YouTube tries to demonetize us, but I'm able to take him down. It was a bit of a struggle despite our powerful Dragonite, but ultimately nothing we couldn't deal with. I was worried for a moment I'd have to grind up more mons for the League, but with the three legendary birds in the box, I ended up perishing the thought. Getting to the League was a cinch, and so was taking down the Elite Four. Honestly, I wish there was more to say, but I'd be lying if I tried to play it up like some big dramatic ordeal. Dragonite took down most things, and what it couldn't we had Zapdos and Moltres for. It was simple. Not even the champion fight with YouTube gave me any problem. With that, we, ourselves, are now champions. The 12-pack, Dragonite, Venusaur, the legendary birds, and for some reason, an underleveled Snorlax as well. What a show. My part may be coming to an end, but don't touch that recommended section just yet. There's still plenty more beyond the Pokemon League. But until the next 12-pack video, I'm out. Happy holidays to everyone, and I hope you all have an amazing end of the year. It's been a tough one for everyone, so let's try to finish out strong and optimistic as we can. 
good vibes. Bye guys, stay cool, and peace out. Well, hello everyone, my name is Wiggo, and welcome to my part of the Professor Oaks challenge on Pokemon Leave Green. My part will consist of the post game, so I will be capturing everything on the Sevi Islands, but I won't be evolving any of the Pokemon that I have to capture because that part is going to be for the next contestant. Of course, I start off by going to one island and talk to Celio in order to trigger the event with Team Rocket. I then go to Mount Ember and beat up some Team Rocket grunts, and of course do some very big brain puzzles that you can only solve with an IQ of 69 or higher. Go all the way down to Mount Ember to pick up the Ruby as well, then go back to the Pokemon Center on one island to give this ruby to Celio so that he can install it into his big machine thing. But he then tells me that there is another gem that we have to pick up, the Sapphire, which is hidden somewhere else. But before we do that, it's time for us to do our first badge of Pokemon catching. Or should I say Pokemon hatching? Because we're gonna be hatching some eggs. A lot of them. So I go to the good old daycare on the fourth island. I put all of the Pokemon that need baby evolutions in there and I start hatching. This way I get myself a Tyrogue, a Pichu, I also hatch a Magby, a Cleffa, a Smoochum, and last up an Iggly Buff. Now it's time to go to every single island and capture every Pokemon that hasn't been obtained yet. So on one island I capture a Slugma down at Mount Ember. I then travel to three island to capture a Dunsparce because that cave has now opened up. Then go to the Ice Cave on fourth island to capture a Swinup and a Sneasel. And while surfing in the cave you can also get a Meryl. I then do the event with Lorelei at the end of the cave but that was apparently not necessary but I did it anyway. I then went to fifth island, captured myself a Remoraid over there by fishing in the I also found a Hoppip. If you surf all the way west, there will be this guy waiting for you to give you a Togepi egg, which we will be hatching later on. I then go to the Lost Cave to pick up one Pokemon here, and that is Miss Dreavus. But I also pick up the Lax Incense and the Sea Incense because those are needed for two more Pokemon, namely Why Not and Azuril. Because if you want to get these Pokemon, Wobbuffet and Meryl have to be holding these items in order to be able to breed Why Not or Azuril. I then go to the sixth island where I capture myself a Natu a Yanma and a Wobbuffet and after capturing these three Pokemon I decided to go down the dotted hole and get the Sapphire but before you actually get the Sapphire this Team Rocket scientist steals it from you and you have to go retrieve it later. But before we do that I go north first because I have to pick up three more Pokemon. These consist of Heracross, Lediba, and also Spinarak. After capturing these, I decide to hatch a few more eggs and now I hatch the Togepi egg. I breed a Wobbuffet with the Lax Incense in order to get a Why Not. And I also bred a Meryl with the Sea Incense in order to get Azuril. We then travel to the seventh island where I complete another puzzle made for five-year-olds. After that, it's time to pick up all of the Pokemon on this island. These consist of Sentret, Fanfi, Larvitar. If you go all the way south of this island, you can find an unknown. And by surfing over here, you can get your last Pokemon, Mantine. So those were all the Pokemon that you could capture at the islands. Now it's time for us to complete the post-game story. So we beat up the Team Rocket Scientist. And after beating him, he gives us the Sapphire, which we can use to give to Celio. He pops it into his machine, and this is the post-game over. Which means that you can now unlock Cerulean Cave, which means that we can capture Mewtwo. So that's our final part here. I go up to Mewtwo, throw a billion gazillion balls at him. Reason why I'm not using my Master Ball here is because Plunk will need him later on for capturing one of the roaming legendaries. That concludes my section, so now I'm going to pass over the torch to Plunk. Thank you so much to Chaotic for having me in this video. Don't forget to subscribe! Hello everybody, it's Arantula back again, here to just say that there are a few Pokemon that Zuko collected he was not supposed to, so I'm just showing them off right here, right now. They were never mentioned in this section of the video, but I want to make sure that everything is peachy keen, as I am, after all, Kayla Meeple's editor. And with that, Plunker Boy, the stage is yours. Take us home, buddy. Alright, finally, it's my time to finish up this challenge. As you may or may not know, I'm Plunker Boy 900 and while I do know a tiny bit about Professor Oak's challenges, I've never actually done one myself. So let's see what I'll be taking on today. Well then, Zwiggo seems to have already carried quite a lot of the work for me, having already captured all but one Pokemon for the section. So basically all I've got to do now is all the grinding, that's fun. He could have left some of the more exciting stuff for me, but I suppose legendary hunting will suffice. So I went ahead and grabbed a party straight away, since I noticed that I only had Dragonite in my party. So I added Chansey, Golbat and Togepi since they all evolved through happiness. I also grabbed Lavatar as it evolves at a really high level, as well as Mewtwo for another Pokemon so I can actually battle. Then I went for the League. 
This has got to be the best place to grind, as Wigger has already finished the Ruby and Sapphire side quest over in the Sevi Islands, meaning I'll be having to go against Pokemon in the 60s and 70s. So I slapped the EXP share on Larvitar, made my way through once, and realised that this was not going to be fast. So I looked up some of the higher level trainers and noticed that on Seven Island that there's a few Pokemon Rangers standing next to each other just south of the Pokemon Center. One of which having two level 55 Victory Bells and the other with two level 55 Vile Plumes. Both Mewtwo and Dragonite can hit these for super effective damage. So I changed the battle mode to shift to get 75 EXP on my Lavatar by leading with it and then swapping it back into the additional Pokemon instead of 50% I was getting in the league. Yeah, I could have turned it off then, but honestly, I just forgot. Plus, it would have made things like Calm My Mewtwo sweeping impossible. So here I was, grinding away, taking more steps for both the happiness of my Pokemon and to repeatedly charge the Versus Seeker. And at this point, I'm really starting to question why Meat Ball decides to do these challenges. I mean, he's actually done most of the game so far. Even some ROM hacks. I'm more than happy with just doing this one small section, thanks. But fair play to him, he has a lot more patience than I do. Case in point, after I evolved Lavatar into Pupitar and got it to about level 41, I abandoned grinding for the time being and instead wanted to do something new, so I decided to go and hunt for Entei. I really like the idea that you can get one of the Gen 2 Legendary Beasts as Aroma in this game, but damn, it took a long time. Not only that, but I used over 70 Max Repels attempting to find this beast. It took about an hour before I finally managed to find it on Route 6, and you bet I immediately tossed my Master Ball, because let me tell you, I was not going through that again. I'm just lucky that no one used it on a Pidgey or something. That's something that Zwiggo would do. With that though, there's really not much else to say. Everything apart from Puppetar evolves at a low enough level, to where a few fights against those Pokemon Rangers is enough. This lets me evolve Puppetar into Tyrantar at level 55, Fanfing into Donphan at level 25, Meryl into Azumarill at level 18, Spinarak into Ariados at level 22, Ledibert into Ledian at level 18, Natu into Zatu at level 25, Remoraid into Octillery at level 25, Sentra into Furret at level 15, Swinub into Piloswine at level 33, Hoppiv into Skipbloom at level 18, and then again into Jumpluff at level 27. Tyrogue evolves into Hitmontop at level 20 with equal attack and defense stats, Slugma evolves into Mokargo at level 38, and finally our friendship evolutions, Togepi into Togetic, Golbat into Crobat, and Chansey into Blissey. Finishing off the challenge with a time of 77 hours and 40 minutes. I'm really happy to have finished this challenge off. And well, we did fail to beat Chaotic's original time for Fire Red, but come on, we're a bunch of newbies. So I think we did pretty well. Thank you again Chaotic for having me on this video. And uh, oh, you, you don't seem to have an outro planned for this video. Well, leave that to me. If you guys enjoyed this video, then please make sure to leave a like, comment and subscribe. Click the bell and tell a friend, but don't spend more than a minute doing that since if you are, you're taking way too long. We all really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this video. So if you could just subscribe to all of us over at the 12 pack, our channels will be linked in the description below. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you with another 12 pack video soon. Plonk out. <laughs>